we go. You're listening to Law and Gospel on this Monday, February the 12th, in the year of our Lord, 2024. And we're going to be taking a look at readings for the first Sunday in Lent. Yep, we're in the Lenten season. The church year is quite different than the calendar year. It begins in December with Advent, moving to the Epiphany season, which we ended with a transfiguration last Sunday. And now we are in the Lenten season. And that'll move us to Holy Week with Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and then we kind of look forward to the Ascension, Pentecost, and the Sundays after Pentecost until we start over again about the second or third Sunday in December with the first Sunday in Advent. So that's the church year. And today we're looking at February the 18th 2024, which is the first Sunday in Lent. The Old Testament reading is a well-known one from Genesis 22, where Abraham is told to slaughter his son Isaac. The gospel reading is from Mark chapter 1, talking about Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit driving him into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. The text ends after John was arrested Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That verse 15 of Mark 1 is so critical because that summarizes the Christian faith. Repentance is an announcement on our part that we are sinners and we are blamed for our sin. Nobody or nothing else. And believing in the gospel is to trust the promises of Jesus Christ who died on the cross to forgive us our sins. So Mark is very important. I want to say just a few things about Genesis 22, when God came to Abraham and he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, the very next sentence you would think would say something. So Abraham began to discuss with God why he would want his son Isaac to be killed. God had promised that through Isaac, guess what? There would be many, many more nations under Abraham, as many as, well, the sand on the seashore and the stars in the heaven. But instead, the next verse does not have Abraham arguing with God. It says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. 
And Abraham cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God told him. Now, verse 5 is really important because on the third day when Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar, he said to the two young men who had come, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy, that would be Isaac, will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, was Abraham lying about that? If he knew that he was going to go there to sacrifice Isaac, how could Isaac come again with him back to the two men? Well, the answer to that is found in the book of Hebrews, where it talks about the great faith of the believers, chapter 12, and talks about Abraham believing that just as Isaac had been begotten from a dead womb, remember how old Sarah had been, She should not have had a baby at that time, and yet she did. So also Abraham believed that even if Isaac was sacrificed, which would have meant a knife and burning, God would also raise him from the dead to bring him back to those men. And of course, He laid Isaac, his son, on the altar. Isaac said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Boy, that's important that that's already mentioned in Genesis 22, the need for a lamb. And that reminds us of how Jesus was referenced in the New Testament by John the Baptizer, the Lamb of God sent into the world to deliver the world from their sin. At any rate, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the both of them went on together to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built the altar, laid wood on the altar, and bound his son Isaac on the altar on top of the wood. I've often wondered how that could be done in a movie. Would not Isaac have complained? Or would he have not maybe fought with Abraham? Well, none of that is mentioned. In fact, one of the movies I saw where that occurred is that when Abraham went to get Isaac, Isaac fainted. Abraham lifted it up onto the altar and bound him. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And after the slaughter would come the burning. But as soon as the knife was raised, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Now notice that's the angel of the Lord. And when that phraseology is mentioned in the Old Testament, it's always referring to Jesus as the angel of the Lord. And what did the angel of the Lord say? Abraham, Abraham. Abraham responded, here am I. And the angel of the Lord Jesus said, do not lay your hand 
on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. This is a great verse to show that the angel of the Lord is God himself. Because he says, Abraham did not withhold his son from me. And the me, of course, was take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him there as a burnt offering. And that would be for God. So having said that, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son Isaac. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, it says in verse 14, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring. And here he mentions as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. Billions of people will be, have become Christian by the time of judgment day. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring, that is those who follow Isaac, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because Abraham, you have obeyed my voice. That is the voice of the angel of the Lord and even says, declares the Lord. And that's in capital letters, referring to the name of Yahweh that Moses is going to hear on Mount Sinai. So those are some important points of Genesis chapter 22. As we said, Mark 1 is about the baptism of Jesus, his being tempted in the wilderness and preaching the kingdom of God, repent and believe in the gospel in Galilee. But what's the epistle about? It's from James chapter one. Yes, James also wrote a book of the Bible. Verse 12 begins, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. The test is what? The trials of this world. And in fact, if we go back to Genesis 22, Verse 1 says, after these things, God tested Abraham, telling him to kill his son Isaac. So our life as Christians in this earth are standing the test of the trials that are endured. And 
God has promised to those who love him that they will be blessed. And those blessings can be found in Matthew chapter 5. Now, verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Well, then where do our temptations come if they don't come from God? They come from three places. They come from the devil, the world, and our flesh. The devil obviously tempts us as he tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, telling them that his words were far better to listen to because God said if he, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. But the devil said, no, you won't die. You will become like God. So when Eve and Adam heard that, becoming like God seemed much more important than dying. So they ate and fell into rebellious sin. God did not tempt them, the devil did. And we're often tempted by the world. How much do we hear in the United States today and in the world? People denying the word of God and wanting them to listen to their own selves, to what's going on, to what they think is the right thing to do, not what God wants them to do. Verse 14 explains it. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. That's called the old Adam, our sinful nature whereby we inherited sinfulness from Adam and Eve. That is what tempts us. And then that desire, when it has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And that death is referring to eternal death in hell. So God never tempts you. You're tempted by yourself, by your own self, by your own desire, which gives birth to sin as it did with Adam and Eve and when it is fully grown, it brought forth to them death until God gave them a promise in Genesis 3.15. Yes, they would die temporal death, but they would not die with an eternal death because the promise was made that through the seed of Eve, would come a redeemer, a savior. Now it took centuries for that to come about as it did through the Virgin Mary with the birth of the son of God. But God fulfilled his promise. So Moses writes, I'm sorry, James writes, in chapter 1, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. You see, that's what every sin is. It's a deception. It's a lie. And people trust 
the lie and the liar. As Jesus says, the devil is the father of lies. But every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation of shadow due to change. The Father of lights is God the Father. And what's the perfect gift that comes down from above? It's the light, Jesus Christ, light of the world, the morning star, that which conquers the darkness, and that which changes unbelief to faith, which means believing in the promises of Jesus Christ where there is no variation or shadow due to change, which means once God makes a promise, it is fulfilled, often in ways better than can even be imagined. Verse 18 again speaks in James 1 of the Father, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, of his creatures. We are the first fruits of his creatures. We are human beings. There is nothing else in creation that comes before us because we are connected to the greatest first fruit of creation, and that is Jesus Christ. And remember, Pentecost refers to the first fruit. The first fruit when people were given faith of the Holy Spirit, when they were baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and became one with Jesus as their brother, God as their father, and the Holy Spirit as the one who would lead them through a life of sanctification. That word of truth was explained further last week in the Transfiguration when God the Father said about his son Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him. In fact, I heard a sermon that was preached on transfiguration, and the theme of the sermon was the word listen. Listen to what? Not to your selfish nature, but to the new nature inspired by the Holy Spirit to listen to him and obey what Jesus had to say. In fact, when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he told his apostles who were with him, don't tell anyone about what you have seen and heard until the Son of Man rises from the dead. Jesus was talking a fourth time in the Gospel of Mark that he would be resurrected from the dead. 
that's what KFUO is all about. Preaching the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. Those are the facts that come from the Bible. And they come from the Bible because the Bible is the word of God. You cannot convince anyone of evidence for what Jesus has said. You instead simply repeat the words of Jesus and through the faith given by the Holy Spirit, those words become sufficient evidence to believe the promises of the gospel. The gospel makes no sense that God has decided to forgive you all your sins because of the death of his son on the cross and his resurrection from the dead and his incension. I like to refer to those as the four shuns. The incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the incident and the ascension. Indeed, great news of why heaven is going to be your home, who trust in Jesus for salvation. Listen Monday for more on Law and Gospel. God bless you. Listen to Law and Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law and Gospel, please make your check out to Law and Gospel and mail to Law and Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.